The world of finance might seem to be a strange one when viewed from outside. A bit like in Japanese, yokai no sekai. All kinds of strange, incomprehensible instruments, elements, practices, institutions, technical terms. And generally a lot of people think that what comes from the world of finance generally isn't so good for the world of humans. Well, that's a bit unfair. More than a bit unfair. As you can see, I'm a bit of a fan of Gegege no Kitaro. And, you know, Kitaro came from the, uh, the world of yokai, of the spirits, and he's a good guy, getting rid of the bad ones. Uh, in the regulation of finance, of course, and even decent financial firms themselves, they're a little bit like Kitaro, I think, trying to drive out the bad ones from the industry so that, as a whole, finance serves society pretty well. So, how does finance serve human society? Okay, well, first of all, of course, it provides a payments mechanism. This is just fundamental. Uh, wherever you go these days, you can wave a bit of plastic, your phone or whatever. We have virtual payment systems. Uh, this is hugely significant. It gives assurance and convenience, so that's a basic element. Uh, we see that financial institutions play a basic role in aggregation, in bringing together uh, lots of small amounts of savings, for example, your Otoshri Dharma, you know, your uh, money that you're given on New Year, for example. Uh, you put it in your bank, uh, banks aggregate that, and uh, they will lend it to borrowers who need large sums of money, for example, to, to build a factory, to, to um, develop a new business, for example. Then there's a disaggregation function. This is the reverse. Uh, this is where large sums of money are put for safekeeping, either into banks or through a whole range of interesting financial instruments, uh, distributed to uh, lenders of smaller finance. So credit card companies, for example, effectively provide a disaggregation function. Uh, a large bank that uh, takes huge deposits from its corporate clients, for example, you know, Apple makes billions of dollars in free cash flow and they need to store that money somewhere. So banks will take some of that cash and they will provide microcredit, uh, whether it's your credit card, whether it's a car loan, uh, whether it's a home loan, for example. And now another really important function of finance is overcoming timing preferences, temporal preferences temporal being time. Uh, typically, if you've got some spare cash and you want to put it in the bank, uh, even if you can prepare to wait for a while to not touch it to get a higher interest rate, for the most part, people don't want to put money into a term deposit, for instance, teki in Japanese, for more than a year. On the other hand, if you want to go and buy yourself a house, uh, you typically want to be able to repay that loan over something like 25, 30, 35 years, okay? So very different timing preferences. So financial institutions, and in this case banks in particular, play this key role of taking deposits on a short-term basis and lending on a long-term basis. Now that, entry, that introduces potentially very large risks for the banks, timing risks. Uh, banks have to make sure that they maintain the confidence of their depositors if everyone suddenly wants their money back. Uh, and they've lent it to uh, borrowers, then you can end up with a crisis which involves what we call a run on the banks. So we see that uh, there's a trust element, but there's also just a uh, managing of maturities problem. So we'll often see that banks are offering different interest rates for different periods on term deposits. Sometimes it seems a little bit strange. Shorter terms are actually a higher interest rate than longer terms. You think you should get paid a higher interest rate, right, for leaving the bank, uh, your money in the bank for longer. But it may be that, say, in six months' time or eight months' time, uh, the bank has a whole lot of uh, deposits coming due. So its maturity period is uh, coming up then, and there's no guarantee that the depositors will renew their deposits. So we'll see that banks are constantly looking at these timing issues for when their potential obligations to return money to depositors come about and try and steer future depositors, new customers, new depositors, into putting money um, for a certain period of time 
that suits that balancing of temporal risk. There are two other functions that financial markets and institutions within them provide. One of them is facilitation, bringing, for example, lenders and borrowers together, uh, buyers and sellers, uh, investors and those who are capital needy, bringing them together in various ways. And I've spoken about facilitation in, relay, in, in relation to a range of other businesses that are emerging, particularly with the rise of the digital economy. Now, the other very important element, and we can think of banks, for example, as taking on this key role, is intermediation. Intermediation is where, in finance speak, the institution, for example, the bank, interposes, interposes its balance sheet uh, into the transaction. So when a bank takes a deposit from one party and then offers a loan to another party, it goes through the institution of the bank. The risk rests with the bank, okay? So this intermediation function. And there's a very important reason why interme intermediation is such a common element, for example, with investment funds and, and so many other institutions. They have the expertise to manage the risk. They are in the market all the time. They are investing in risk assessment, in analysis. And so it makes a lot of sense for those who have the best capacity to assess risk to bear the risk. So interme intermediation is a key element in finance. Just to remind us, facilitation by contrast, the facilitator does not take on board the risk of the transaction. So if we see a uh, stock market and the stockbrokers who are just simply bringing the buyers and sellers together, it's at the risk of the buyer, of course, and the, uh, the seller may regret having sold too, too cheaply subsequently, for instance, but all the facilitator has done is a kind of a matching exercise. You know, it's uh, almost as if you introduce two friends, uh, they got married and they turned out to be not very happy and they turned around and wanted to blame you. Well, you say, hey, I'm just the facilitator. Um, all I did was bring you together, but the, uh, the risk was entirely upon yourselves, okay? Um, in the case of intermediation, uh, whenever the firm interposes itself within the transaction, it buys and then it plans to sell later on, it has all of the, all of the risks involved. Shifts in price, uh, shifts in demand, of course, which underpin uh, shifts in price, and uh, all of the risks associated with holding a product at a time. So if you watch the movie Margin Call, for example, you can see that in a critical scene in that movie, uh, set at the, uh, the outbreak of the global financial crisis, it's set around the time of the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers, we can see there that the huge panic in the firm is that they realise that uh, they have been engaging in intermediation, they have been buying some assets, assembling them in very complex, uh, into complex financial products and then selling them on to other investors, and that it takes them about a month to process all of this assembling of the different categories of investments into the product they're selling and to on-sell. And with the, uh, the market suddenly having deteriorated, they realise that they're in significant danger of having those assets rest on their books, stay on their books, so they become responsible for these assets that are falling dramatically in price. So anyone who gets into trading, buying and selling, is effectively engaged in intermediation and in that movie Margin Call, for example, the actor who, is the, who plays the boss says that his role is to figure out when the music stops. It's like musical chairs. Um, if no one's buying, no one's selling, uh, you hope to have a chair. You may not have no chair at all. Uh, in a uh, financial downturn, you don't want to be caught holding assets that are going to decline a lot further in value. So interme intermediation is a very risky business. You have to be good at that uh, risk assessment, but sometimes big unexpected events come along, such as COVID-19, for example, or the global financial crisis uh, in 2007, 2008, and your best models did not fully account for the risk that you bear. Facilitation is a safer business to be in, uh, but on the other hand, facilitation always faces competition from new entrants into the market. And particularly with the rise of the digital economy, 
the entry costs for establishing new platforms for facilitating, as we see this with budget stockbroking companies, for example, are relatively low, and so the margins have fallen dramatically. So there's quite intense price competition in a whole range of businesses. You need only to look at real estate agents too and how most countries have too many um, real estate agents. So they're the key things with finance. Um, we shouldn't be scared by finance. Certainly when times are tough or when our own life circumstances are in a bad way, sometimes finance, financial institutions do arise uh, seemingly like evil spirits to uh, make our life even more messy. But overall, they should be thought of more as the lifeblood of a capitalist economy. Without very vibrant financial systems and financial institutions, you simply would not be matching the capital rich to the capital poor. And the simple truth of capitalism, shihonshugi, of, of a market system, is that it takes investment uh, to grow businesses, to employ people, to serve customers. And invariably, there are going to be a lot of risks involved in any market system. And ideally, we can have a vibrant financial system that allows that risk to be shared with people who can most afford to bear it. And of course, uh, those financial parties which play a role in helping to assess and price that financial risk are absolutely critical to the efficiency of managing that risk.